Thanks very much, Raymond, and good afternoon to you all. It's great to be back here again. Um, I'm somewhat embarrassed because I am leading off the discussion, and it's always slightly intimidating to be leading when uh, Professor Hutchful is uh, behind me. Um, so I have to be careful in, in what I say. But we decided that, that institutions lead in this sense, so no denigration of the Augusta University in, in Michigan. But uh, it's true that I am from around the corner, uh, the World Bank. And uh, I think, as I said to um, a number of your colleagues this time last year, that I think it's a great opportunity that increasingly people, staff, from development institutions are sitting down with colleagues such as yourself who come from the security sector. Um, because as uh, Raymond has said, many of the challenges that you face and we face are similar ones. Uh, and without uh, combining hands, if you will, uh, those challenges will remain and we won't necessarily find the solutions. So I think that's the kind of um, the, the main gist of this afternoon's session is to really look at, in concrete terms, the, the linkages between development actors such as myself and security ones such as yourselves. And what I want to do is to look a little bit at some generalities, some of the concepts, a little bit about uh, where those concepts lie in the current context, and then uh, unpick a little bit what this nexus between security and development means. And then uh, I will end by uh, giving you a little bit of an intro into the work that we've been doing, uh, looking at the financing, which is the coins here, uh, for a lot of the capital investment, a lot of the equipment, um, the weapons that, that you procure on behalf of your governments uh, for, for national and human security. So... Um, that's the beginning. Uh, there's some slides from uh, Syria, in fact, looking at the destruction of war and then those who participate in war. And those are the kinds of things that the bank is increasingly working on. Um, and these are issues that have been around for some 20 years. I don't think there's one big breakthrough document or piece of work uh, that one can say, okay, this is uh, really the origins of the security development nexus. Uh, I've just listed a few there, ranging from reports to interventions, ranging from, for example, the seminal work of UNDP, which began to say in public policy terms that we're not only thinking about national security, but we're also thinking about individuals and human security. There's still a debate about what human security means. It's narrowness. Is it really freedom of fear, freedom of injury, freedom of, of uh, uh, involuntary death? Or is it larger in terms of food security, job security, health security? I tend to lie on the narrower version, um, but that's a debate that we can, we can discuss. It also came about because of the Somalia and Rwanda interventions. Um, those were not only military and peacekeeping failures, they were also failures of development and humanitarian intervention. There's a great book by Peter Uvin on Rwanda called Aiding Violence. And really it's a critique of development institutions such as my, my own, which really remained blind to many of the structural fault lines that existed in Rwanda really right up until April uh, 1994, and you had development bureaucrats like myself that uh, went merrily down to the Ministry of Finance, really oblivious uh, to what was going on. Then we had the emergence of this doctrine, this practice of which you are very much part, which is looking at the security sector within the overall uh, public sector reform of governments, of HR systems, human resource management, public financial management, and that really began uh, to take place, and, and in fact, Dr. Ebo is, was one of the founders of that work in the late 90s. Um, going on from there, we had in Europe what are called whole-of-government approaches to international challenges. I think in, in the U.S. that was translated into defense diplomacy and development. Uh, this certainly came out of both Anglophone and Nordic 
governments that said that not one perspective uh, could be used to challenge many of the wicked problems that we face. And then on from there was the seminal events of, of 9-11. Uh, I think there was a, a little bit of a distraction around the links between poverty and terrorism. Um, but more interestingly were the, the nightmare misadventures, if you will, in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But what was interesting about a lot of the work that's come out of Iraq and in Afghanistan since was the links made by military actors such as yourselves and the role of development in terms of stabilization uh, and some pathway to counterinsurgency and peace and stability. A lot of that was then talked about in uh, Kofi Annan's report, uh, In Larger Freedom. And uh, last but not least was the World, of World Development Report of 2011, which nothing in that report said very much new, but what was interesting about that report was that it was from coming from the World Bank which is a large uh, development institution which was recognizing these links uh, with security. Just a little bit about context. Um, Steven Pinker in his seminal work, I think is right in saying there's a general reduction in organized conflict over time throughout the centuries and in the 20th and 21st century. But what we can see is more recently an uptick in violence um, and the numbers in killed in conflict, particularly in some of the great protracted conflicts of our time, uh, namely uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. Violence, no doubt, is becoming much more complex. Uh, no longer are we necessarily talking about interstate wars, but really we're talking about civil conflicts, we're talking about terrorism, we're talking about local subnational conflicts. And uh, unfortunately, still, the trend is that the majority of those conflicts uh, reside in the Africa region. That, date, that data is, is uh, current up to 2015. So given this context, how does the security development nexus or paradigm, how does that help us understand some of the challenges that you and I face in these contexts? And so I'll just unpick it a little bit the way I see it, um, which sometimes I think helps concretize a little bit uh, the theory. So firstly, what we can see is, is that insecurity and violence are an impediment to development. So the top line is really those countries that remain in conflict or largely insecure, and they have very little success in meeting basic sustainable development goals, such as in health, education, access to water. Those countries that are at peace, they begin over time to meet those goals. So for example, crime and violence in El Salvador, not a country in conflict anymore, costs 16% of GDP, an enormous number. Uh, the, the WDR of 2011 said that the average civil war costs the equivalent of 30 years of gross domestic uh, product. So enormous costs. There's just a little caveat to this, though, that I think it should be recognized that most his historical state formation is in some way linked to violence. So I, I disagree with the, the uh, theory that um, insecurity is development in, in reverse. If you look at the history of the US, the history of Britain, those are countries where, which are obviously developed and rich now, but they have been built on violence. So I think we need to, to recognize that, that link. The next way to unpick it is to look at underdevelopment can lead to insecurity. And there, there's a whole uh, number of different theories around the causes of violence and the causes of conflict um, for which we could spend a lot of time. I won't. But what I will say is that the individual risk factors of someone committing violence are indeed um, associated with poverty, unemployment, lack of education, lack of life chances. And there's a lot of literature out there. I think in terms of 
drawing those conclusions at the national level, there is, there's much more debate around that. And the, the evidence around saying, for example, if you have a country where there's a high unemployment rate, you're likely to be in conflict. Um, that's not necessarily true. But what was interesting about this big report that we did in 2011 was that there was this shift um, from where the common theory was that countries with low incomes were more inclined to be in conflict. And there was a famous economist, Paul Collier, who was very much behind this, this theory. And there were many of us uh, that said, well, actually, that may not be the case. And you can see now that there are quite a few countries which are middle-income countries, which are in conflict. For example, Iraq, Syria, Ukraine. Um, and it's more about the institutions which reside in those countries and their ability to manage conflicts so they don't necessarily become violent um, and they become more, they're, they're resolved politically. Another side of the coin is looking at development aid as an instrument, and that can cause violence, that can cause insecurity. And again, there's a lot of literature on this, very much coming from the humanitarian world, whereby analysis has been done uh, on, for example, food relief uh, and other types of relief which have supported rebel movements. Uh, and being used for personal and political gain. Uh, there's been quite a lot of work being done in Afghanistan and Iraq, which is uh, the reason uh, whereby they have an enormous amount of data, both looking at violent event data and the deployment of aid. And again, some of the evidence suggests that aid can actually contribute to the increase of probability of, of conflict. There's also quite a lot of literature out there now in terms of the, the links between corruption as a cause of insecurity. So I don't think uh, one can necessarily say that development is always a good. Uh, sometimes it can, can lead to bad unintended consequences. Finally, uh, there are ways in which development is an instrument which itself has security objectives. Um, so it's not necessarily uh, instruments of coercion, such as weapons, which can have security objectives, but development itself uh, can uh, be behind, can be, be part of a, an overall government strategy to increase security in any given context. Uh, there's been a lot of work on this in terms of Vietnam um, up to the present day in terms of the use of aid to win hearts and minds. Development has also been used for particular military strategies, for example, disarmament, demobilization, demining, and increasingly in, in Latin America, you can see uh, countries which are shifting from very uh, hardline policing strategies to ones which are more looking at, for example, use of schools and community work to try and address uh, insecurity, crime, and violence. And then there's the work of Andy Mack, um, which, which is, uh, he's no longer producing, but was the Human Security Report, which came out of British Columbia, whereby he was looking at the overall effects of peace building and peacekeeping, and the way in which that was having quite a significant impact in terms of reducing violence. So in sum, uh, what I've tried to do was just unpick certain ways in which one looks at what is quite an abstract theory, uh, this idea that security and development are linked, and to, to, to see what does that actually mean in practice. I'm gonna end by just looking at a particular uh, way in which we've looked at it in the, in the bank, which, as I've said, this is this uh, uh, thick tome, uh, big door stopper, uh, which is coming out at the end of this week. And this starts from the premise that governments themselves are the, the largest providers, the largest funders of uh, security um, and criminal justice. And that most, since most of the funding is, is provided by domestic revenues, the key question is, 
Are those monies being used effectively and efficiently? The World Bank for about 20 years has been working with governments on asking those questions in the other sectors, health, education, agriculture, water, and so on. What we've done is we've adapted that instrument and we're now looking at the military, looking at police, and looking at criminal justice institutions. And we're looking at these critical questions of affordability, of effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. So just to give you a few examples, in, in Somalia, Central Africa Republic, and Liberia, we looked at the whole question of affordability. So what were the options for the government's concern, for example, in terms of establishing an army of a certain size? And what would the costs of that army be over time in relation to the revenues which were being secured by that government? And wh wh what kind of constraints and trade-offs were those governments going to face over the next two, five, and 10 years? And so what we've done is we've in injected a little bit of financial uh, and evidence rigor to that discussion, rather than necessarily being an aspirational one, but being one set on aspirations, but also in relation to the revenues which were available. Also, the work which we've, we've done in places like Niger, in Mali, um, and in Burkina Faso, is now looking at ways in which governments can make their spending in the security sector much more efficient. So one example is advising on pensions in terms of uh, taking people off the security payroll. Um, and another way is looking at the enormous amount in, in some of these countries that security actors extract from local populations in terms of checkpoints. So where, where do those revenues go? Is that a formal revenue raising authority or is that an informal revenue raising authority? So it's that kind of advice, whereby both ministers of finance, uh, leadership within the militaries, and ministries of defense can start making key decisions about getting a, a, a better bang for your buck, so to speak, in, in these critical, critical areas of, of security. So I will stop there and now hand over to the professor. Thank you very much.